more cooperative. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I'll get out of your picture. Well, you're not in my picture. Oh, that's good. I'm you're just shooting the... Got to get the sign. Yeah, you already got a picture of me in the post office. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't want to get that matched <laughs> up, do you? I don't even I'm, think they do that anymore. I change my hat every day to the camp. <laughs> I got another one, but it's black. <laughs> <laughs> talk more about these kinds, I have still more questions. Okay. Um, I don't, this might be so elementary, but what is a, the difference between a dab pen and your normal bait pen? So, uh, I'm going to put you on speakerphone, okay? Okay. Here we go. So this is one of my staff members, Ashley. Ashley, tell these poor people here, including myself, what's the difference between a dab pen and a vape pen? You know, they they feel they feel different. What they do that we have that we have is they are done in a cannabis oil approach to the English under like gold base. So we are getting a thing more pure of the um oil um to hit um as opposed to the normal base that is cut with English under like gold base to them. Um so these are gonna be a little bit stronger, a little bit more pure than what you're used to. Um but other than that it, you know, it's still a vaporizer in this Okay, so there's really so, no difference between a dab pen. So and a there's vape no pen. difference between a dab pen and a vape pen. It's just that the oil is is pure, the concentration of yeah, oil. Yeah, that's what right. Exactly. Okay. And, and then we had the, I should have brought that little piece of paper with me. Two second draw gives you what? Two point five milligrams of the three percent. This is the brand. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> we're the French Laundry Concentrate Company, and we're based in the village of Mendocino, and we do all solventless extracts, so no butane, no CO2 involved. And um, our main product is our, uh, our hash, which is uh, ice and water extract. And uh, we also carry rosin, which is a further form of uh, purification of the cannabis concentrate. And uh, we're just doing some vending out here today at the local 215 Farmer's Market. It's, uh, it's been about 10 years that our company's been up and running, and we've worked really hard to find uh, organic growers, locally sourced. Um, I say that separates us a little bit, but also uh, we like to put a lot of... Uh, emphasis on the solventless aspect. we just not using those, those uh, butane and, and any forms of chemicals in our process. Um, and we do reach the same THC levels um, as most of those products, so we're, we're bringing a comparable organic product to the table. The medical benefits of concentrate are huge, um, and that's what we've been doing for the, you know, under Proposition 215 for the last few years, we've been selling as medical. Um, and now we're transitioning into the rec market, and uh, that's where we're going with the future of it. But as of now, we're, we're, we're me medical. We're medical right now, so. We don't carry many CBD products. We'd like to, um, but once again, we like to source from only organic and only locally sourced farmers, and it's hard to find a lot of CBD product locally. Um, besides that, uh, our rosin tests in at like high 70s to low 80% THC, and our hash is testing in um, high 50s to low 70s as well. So, uh, yeah, so certain batches, uh, our full melt, for instance, we don't mess with. We leave it as it is because it tests so high, and we usually press our bubble and mid-grade hashes into rosin to up the levels of THC and, and bring a more pure product. Uh, we sell to uh, local cooperatives. We do a lot of our own distribution. Um, so we're all the way from Nor uh, well, Northern California all the way to L.A. and Hollywood. Um, we do have a few distributors, um, but once again, we do a lot of our own distribution, networking with cooperatives and, uh, and vending to the businesses. So uh, we got an Instagram, and it's uh, the French Laundry Hash. Uh, and uh, besides that, <laughs> sorry, you caught me off guard on that one. Uh, besides that, I mean, uh, we've got a Weed Maps as well. And Weed Maps uh, keeps an up-to-date profile of all of our concentrates and where the locations are that they are vended. 
And um, the Leonard Moore Cooperative is a great way to reach out to our business. We're, um, we're all a family here, and so we work very closely together. So if you need to get in touch with the French Laundry for any reason, I would, I would suggest calling the Leonard Moore Cooperative. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. We are on Cannabis News and Views, and my name is Jude Tillman, your host, and I'm talking with Brandon. Brandon, hi. Hi, Jude. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you very much. So, Brandon, tell us a little bit. Uh, you're a vendor here at the Mendocino 420 Market. Tell me what you're vending. Who's your company? Uh, we're Blazing Oaks. We're uh, a family-run farm based out of the Snell Valley outside Hoplin. We've been there for three generations. We're a true family homestead, and we're here uh, vending some of our flowers today. Oh, how wonderful. A true family homestead. What does that mean? Well, it means it was a raw piece of land when we moved there about 30 years ago. So everything on the property was built by my parents and by myself, and uh, now we're raising our family there as well. So we have, a th we have three generations on the same land that's growing in the Emerald Triangle, some of the best cannabis. This, you are the, you're the people that the stories and the, the mythology is, is woven around. It's wonderful to meet you. Um, so were, do you grew up on a cannabis farm? Uh, well, on a ranch. Um, I didn't know it was a cannabis farm at that point. Um, but yeah, my family has been in the region for a long time. My grandparents first moved here in the early 60s as part of the Back to the Land movement up in Humboldt. And then they moved down here along with my parents in the early 80s to Mendocino, and we've been here ever since. So we're actually going on four generations now. But my grandparents are unfortunately no longer with us. So only three generations on the farm now. Uh, and were all of these generations all the way back to your grandparents growing cannabis? Uh, yeah, they were. They were some of the original people that moved uh, up to Garberville in the 60s. Do you know much about their history, like how they got started, where they get their seeds? How did that happen? Um, as far as the seeds and genetics, I'm not really sure. Uh, you know, they moved up there originally as part of the Back to the Land movement, so they didn't move up there to grow cannabis initially. It just sort of happened over the years, I guess. Um, and my grandfather was a retired aerospace engineer, so after um, he retired, they wanted to kind of get away from it all and... Uh, settled on Northern California, and we've been here ever since. Uh, it was almost 50 years ago now. Wow, this is fantastic. I'm, I, I had no idea, Brandon. I've seen you around the, around the community, but this is so cool to learn this. So one of the things that I have a million questions now. Um, <laughs> so one of the things, but we'll start with you're growing up in a cannabis family. And when did you realize that your parents were growing an illegal substance? Um, I started to suspect it when I was a teenager, but they were always very careful about that. You know, they made a very big point that it was not something the kids could have anything to do with. So I didn't act, I was not actually allowed to help till I was 18. And I think that's a very sound policy. I don't think it's something children should be involved in. Mm -hmm. And you know, same with our daughter. She knows we grow, but you know, it's very separate. And you're not involving her in it until it'll be her choice later, is it? It'll be her choice when she's 18. Same with, same with me. <laughs> So um, you, your four generations grew cannabis uh, in Humboldt or in Mendocino County? Uh, Humboldt originally, and we moved from Humboldt in the early 80s, uh, shortly after I was born. What is, what is it like when you, when you went to school as a child uh, and your, your friends, your playmates at school would say, well, what do your folks do? How did you deal with that? Well, my father always had a business. We've always had other... Uh, businesses and other sources of income. You know, we, we're a functional cattle ranch. We have been for 30 years. Uh, my father's had a business here for a long time. Um, so it was never, you know, out in the open, really. There was always sort of in the background, sort of an addition to everything else we did. So when did your farm start producing cannabis for uh, 420 markets and this kind of public uh, market display? Well, we've only really been public about it. Uh, the past year or two, you know, once the permit program began and we were a little more comfortable about the legality of it and we could be more out there. So it's been relatively recent for us, uh, only since about a year and a half ago, really, that we've been uh, public about it. 
We're speaking with Brandon, who's a cultivator of craft cannabis here in Mendocino County, and he's a fourth generation cultivator. And uh, so Brandon, big changes uh, going on, regulatory speaking. And uh, how do you feel about uh, the uh, slow regulation and tax uh, apparatus of the state and cultivation of cannabis? Uh, it's been very frustrating. I think they're over-regulating it. They're over-taxing it. Um, the rules keep changing uh, endlessly. I think there's been a very, or a lot of very questionable things that the county has done over the last year or two uh, that have made it very difficult for most people to be compliant. Uh, it seems like no matter what you do, as soon as you think you're almost over the finish line, they change it at the last second. And um, yeah, I don't know. The, uh, the county government has proven to be very difficult and often inept to work with, in my opinion. A lot of people are fle feeling that. Um, do you also, well, would you rather the black market were still here and we didn't even go in the direction of regulation? I wonder sometimes. Um, I guess we'll see. I mean, I never liked the secrecy and the risk of the black market, so I would much rather be out in public about it. Um, you know, I don't, never liked having to hide it. Um, but at the same time, the regulation is putting and will put a lot of people out of business. I think a lot of you know it's not geared towards small farmers, and the county is not supporting the small farmers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Brandon, you bring your craft cannabis here to the 420 market in Mendocino. Uh, certainly not hoping to score a whole lot of money, uh, as as anybody can tell. What's your main goal here? Um, well, we always get to meet lots of interesting people from all over the world. It's always good to go out and meet uh, other farmers. You know, it's been really great that we can actually be more open about it. Um, you know, before it was very uh, compartmentalized because you had to be so secret about it. So we've met some really awesome farmers that are in this area that we never knew were even here in the last year. And you know, also just to get our name out there, get our brand out there, uh, helps a lot. So and it, you know, it's a lot of fun too. We have we enjoy these events. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. But do you think that your brand, your farm, your cannabis can become a part of this $7 billion a year market that is California adult use and medicinal cannabis? Do you think you can actually participate in that market? Well, we certainly hope, uh, hope we can. But again, the regulations are really what are preventing most small farmers from participating. You can have the best product in the world, but just due to so many of these uh, hurdles, which are very, very expensive, uh, many people won't. And that's that has been the biggest concern is, you know, we're not wealthy. We don't have a million dollar company behind us. So if, you know, if you can just endlessly throw money at it, then yeah, you'll probably do all right. But that's not very conducive to most of the locals and the small farmers here. Um, you know, the excessive fees are making it very, very difficult for a lot of people. No, you know, we're all here together. It's a wonderful little gathering of small cultivators and entrepreneurs. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you've got here on the table? Uh, as far as our display? Um, well, these are all photos um, from our ranch um, from over the last season. So, you know, these are mostly uh, from the garden, the cannabis, and these sort of sh showcase sort of the other... You know, the other things going around on the ranch, you know, like I mentioned before, we have been a cattle ranch for 30 years, so we have cows, we have olives, uh, we have pomegranates, you know, we forage for mushrooms in the winter, and, um, you know, it's a lot more than just growing. And then here we have a little uh, history of our region, the Snell Valley region, which has a, a very rich agriculture history going back over 150 years. Um, it was uh, one of the first areas to really... Uh, I'm sorry, it was one of the first areas where uh, organic agriculture really took hold. Uh, Fetzer Vineyards started there, which is now the largest producer of organic wine in the world. Uh, it was a home to, to Mendocino Brewing Company, the first uh, brew pub since Prohibition. Um, and so, you know, we, we have a very uh, long standing, rich history in that area uh, with agriculture, and particularly uh, organic agriculture. And so we've, we're trying to sort of, you know, uh, pay homage to that history. Have you all thought about becoming part of the Appalachians Project or any of the ways that other small cultivators are starting to organize? Oh, yes, we, we've been participating with the Appalachians Project, definitely. So I think that's going to be very important. Uh, you know, Mendocino has so many unique microclimates. It's one of the areas that makes this place so amazing. So uh, you know, you'll see very different expressions in plants than you would in Hopland versus, say, Willits or Laytonville. So. Well, these are um, hashish pre-rolls, so they are flowers ground up with dry sift hash, 
which is made from the trim and then blended back in. It's always the same strain to preserve the uh, what we would call the terpene profile, which is like the flavor and the aroma. And they are uh, in glass test tubes uh, with a wax seal, silver ink stamp to preserve them. The larger ones have a glass tip, which can be reused, and a little bit of hemp wick in there to light them for a butane-free experience, just like you would want with a good cigar. Very nice. And these are all variations of that? Yeah, we have the three different sizes that we uh, that we like to do. These ones are actually a CBD hemp wrap that we've been experimenting with. And then the others are uh, hemp papers. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. Uh, well, at the farmer's markets, we all sell them a little cheaper. So the small ones are usually $10, mediums are 25 and the large ones are 35 Large ones are 35 Woo. Those are some nice looking cigars, stogies, huh? <laughs> Cannabis stogies. Very nice, very nice. Any particular bud you want to highlight? Um, our favorite would probably be the Watermelon Rancher. This is one of our signature strains, which I actually bred over the last couple of years. And smells and tastes like sour watermelon candy. And it took first in the best of harvest event that the Natural Cannabis Company put on in Santa Rosa last year, and it's placed in the Emerald Cup as well. So it's a very unique smell and flavor. Certainly. <laughs> you gotta smell this. Oh, that's wonderful. Here, try that. <laughs> Isn't that nice? It's it sour watermelon. <laughs> that smells wonderful. Makes me want to eat it. <laughs> it's really <laughs> yummy. Oh, very lovely. Thank now you. We, we, we tend to go for very you know flavorful, pungent strains and, and a big variation. You know, every jar smells totally different and unique. Yeah. I don't think people understand. Back when in the 60s, which I do remember, it was all just ditch weed. It was all just marijuana, you know. <laughs> people don't understand how unique these different strains are, how vastly different in taste, in profile, in effect. You know, they're all incredibly different. This is this is very interesting, Brandon. Thank you very much for oh, taking the time you. today. Oh, it was my pleasure. <laughs> all right, I'm your host, Jude Tillman. This is Cannabis News and Views, and we are here at the Mendocino 420 Market. Happens once a month on Saturday afternoons, and it's a great opportunity right here on uh, Ukiah Street for the public to come in and see cannabis at its finest. Is that not true? And we're sitting here with a couple of the uh, representatives of one of the finest cannabis companies in the region, I'll have to say, because it's not Mendocino anymore, is it? Let's get let's get your names. What's your name? I'm Aaron. Aaron and I'm Vincent. Vincent. All right, Aaron and Vincent. Thank you for being on Cannabis News and Views. So tell me, we'll start with uh, you, Vincent. Um, how long have you been working? And tell us who's this company that you're working with here. Uh, this is Madrone. Uh, Madrone, California, is what we call ourselves. Uh, we are a group of, I'd say, probably 20 to 25 farmers based here on the coast of Mendocino. We have a farmer we work with in southern Humboldt and one down in northern Sonoma County as well. Um, we are just a collective of, um, you know, small batch farmers who work on heirloom strains, really trying to keep it small and family oriented. Um, really just trying to promote good practices, really. You know, we, 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 we test all of our cannabis to, you know, ensure that there's no chemicals being used or, you know, pesticides, herbicides, things like that. And... Um, so I've been working with Madrone for about two and a half years since the uh, initiation of Madrone. I've been part of the team from the very beginning. And um, really it's just about kind of promoting the Mendocino area also. Like we really want to make sure that the community of Mendocino is recognized um, for what we do, which is grow quality cannabis. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Vincent. And Aaron, um, add to what he's saying in terms of your relationship to Madrone and what you see Madrone's mission being about. And also, uh, let me add, add another question on, which is... <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll have to deal with that in a minute. <laughs> um, add another question on, which is, uh, do you see Madrone being a part of an Appalachian system in, in this region? I think it very well could be, to answer your second question first. Um, I think that's what we're trying to promote, is, is show exactly what the terroir is about. And, and the, the plant has a way of finding people, and I think this plant in particular has found its home here, and it's all about accentuating what we know and show everyone what we can do, you know, to make it the truest medicine that, uh, that it can be. Um, as far as adding on to what Vincent has said, it's um, Madrone is very interesting in the sense that we are a collective, that it allows for people with good practices to come underneath one banner and say, well, this is what we want the plant to be about. This is what, w w this is what proper expectations 
are and being able to set that set that benchmark um, I don't think there's a better community to to initiate that than the one we have here in Mendocino for sure well then let me ask both of you a, a rather timely question uh, you're you're participating in a community event it's a wonderful event where small craft uh, cannabis farmers come together and um, the question is, with all of the tumult in the county, with all of the regulations and the state regulations and all of the, the hoops that people are being forced to go through, do you see Madrone as a collective of farmers? Do you see you guys being able to survive? I'll start with you this time, Aaron. Um, I think we can. I think we can. Um, whenever, by having the best product available. You know, and whether or not that shrinks into a rather niche market or it has to do with the things greater at play is yet to be decided. But I don't think that uh, it can go unrecognized. And I don't think in this community it would it will be. So I think we will we'll support everyone who's doing things the proper way here. And that's how we build together and create proper regulations for the entire county. Okay, There's right. no infighting, you know, getting behind. And I think everyone that, that I've seen at events like this or with the CGA has that in mind. You know, that this is supposed to be a sustainable idea. CGA being California Growers Association. Let me add, let me put, make this a little bit of a sharper question because oh, that sounds all really fine and dandy. Everybody has good practices, everybody has good intentions, and we're all going to make it. But frankly, a lot of people think they're going to have to throw the towel in. And unless you have really big, deep pockets, like millions of dollars, to scale up to actually participate, Vincent, in this seven billion dollar a year uh, California market, unless you've got super duper rich investors, usually out of state, or a ton of money yourself that you really can't compete. So how, how would you answer that problem? Uh, well, I, I kind of look at it, and this happens a lot with what we call in this country of ours uh, the free market capitalistic system, uh, which I don't agree with at all. I'm not a huge fan of regulations. I'm not a huge fan of, of, of forcing people to have deep pockets. I don't, I don't like that. It's happened in the beer industry. If you look at a lot of the microbreweries in California have been bought out or now sponsored by bigger beer companies. Um, it happens with farms. You have a lot of organic farms that get bought out by, by bigger farms. Um, that is not what I want to see happen. And I think the more that we can try to stick together and fight back against big money and big corporations and, and, and show that if we come together in collectives and co-ops that we can become big and we can support ourselves and still provide great quality products that will we'll do better than some of these fat cats with their big money who come in and don't know what they're doing we're going to still provide the better product. And I think that cream will rise to the top. And maybe we don't make millions and billions of dollars, but we don't need to in our community. We just need to make enough to survive comfortably and live within our means. And the more we do that and the more we support that and the more we show the world that you don't, that, that you don't need millions and billions of dollars to survive and be happy. You know, we just, just keep it simple, keep it small, and keep it family oriented. That's what life should be about. And that's, you know, I, I love this industry because it gives me a chance to voice my opinions about things like capitalism and things like free market, where all it does is it, it, is it only caters to the Donald Trump's of our world, if, if I may, if I may even say his name, it's it's almost like saying Voldemort or something. But I, I, I do believe that we can survive if we stick together, and that's one of the things I do think I like about the legalization movement is it has forced us to come out of the closet and has forced us to stop hiding from each other and to support each other and to come together. And the more we do that, the better. Thank you, Vincent. Aaron, you want to add anything to that? And then I'd like you to give us a little tour of what you're offering here today at the fair. Um, uh, there's not a much more to add to that. I think Vincent covered it in totality. Okay, Aaron, uh, what do you got here? Um, one of uh, our most cherished ones here is, is Viper Cookies. This is, um, as you can see down here, with everything that we sell, we have menus that state not only the THC, but CBD and also terpenes that are involved. So. And I got an eighth of the Viper Cookies? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next thing we have here is Candyland. So um, another like 50-50 kind of clone, but um, mostly what we have here today is, or all we have here today is indoor. This is uh, something called Red Dragon. It's our 100% sativa. Um, yeah, very up, gets you creative, gets you, get things done, you get after it. With what else do you want to say about what you're offering today at this fair? Vincent? Uh, well, we're offering uh, just the chance to, to show how we you know, uh, collaborate with a lot of people. Um, all of our woodwork is done by Nikolai. Uh, which is a local uh, woodworker here in our community. He, he works with all um, 
wood that is found on the forest floor. He doesn't uh, take anything down to, to do his work, but he does everything from the grinders to the rolling trays to these tables, uh, to, you know, to these little stands. So he, he's a huge part of it. Um, we collaborate with Spark and Mike Strupp with these hats. Um, you know, so it's really about, we're, we do a lot of collaborating with a lot of different people. And so for me, we're not just here to promote the cannabis. Again, we're here to promote Mendocino Village and the people in Mendocino. Um, and, you know, this is actually a very small representation of Madrone today. Um, but it, again, it's just really about, you know, we want to talk about, you know, Jordy and Dane and Aaron and Mike and the different farmers that do what they do for us and 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 they're the reason that we're able to do what we do you know I mean you know Aaron and I are a pretty face behind the table but it's really about the farmers that, that are providing the great product <laughs> on that note I think that's absolutely right the pretty faces of Vincent <laughs> and Aaron have just joined us on Cannabis News and Views and thank I you thank so much thank you for what you're doing this is fantastic I think it's wonderful that more people are as positive you know as, as you are and I know that there are some negative things that are happening you know, I totally agree with you on that, but uh, I think if we can look at it from another perspective, and, you know, life is all about perspective, we can change the way things are. All right. Good words. Thanks. Thanks, both of you. Absolutely. Uh, this is Jude Tillman at uh, the 420 Market in Mendocino Village on a beautiful, uh, foggy August day. You're uh, tuned in to Cannabis News and Views, and we're speaking with various vendors in the market. And Janae, why don't you give your full name and who you are exactly? Sure. So my name is Janae Ebert, and I own Shine On Farms, and we're in Anderson Valley. And in between Boonville and Philo, and this is a little picture of our background. We're completely off-grid. We grow everything from seed and have a great time doing it and just believe in all of our organic and biodynamic practices. We have chickens and multiple vegetables that we grow and have our own compost. So we're a pretty clo closed loop system that we're trying to operate and just having a great time being a part of the community. All right, that, that sounds beautiful. I mean, chickens and biodynamic and organic and all of that. But let me ask you this, how are, are, how are you making it in this new regulated market? Or how do you think you will make it next year when you have to start having licenses and permits and, uh, and all of that? Yeah, the permitting parts, you know, it's a challenge just because it's not anything that us farmers have been used to having to deal with and deal with the county so much. But it's okay, and it's what we need to do. And it's great to be finally recognized for our craft and everybody is really appreciative and people are coming around and I think that the way that we're going to be able to survive is just being confident in our artisan products and what sets us aside from everybody else. You know, when you go into a dispensary, you don't see much where you're seeing full sun from Appalachians in our county, which are very specific because everything that I grow from seed in Boonville, you know, it's much more coastal than the inward part. like you know, Covalo, Leightonville. So it's just different, working with different climates and actually being recognized as a farmer and making our products stand out. Absolutely. Well, you sound very optimistic about the ability of craft cannabis to survive in the new climate. Do you think that there's enough of a market already developed to purchase these, uh, this, this high-end, very finely crafted cannabis? I think so. I've noticed a lot of it lately. Uh, just traveling around California, Southern California, the Bay Area, people are very, there's a lot, I think, a lot of more diversity of smokers these days. So it's my parents' friends from the wine industry that are now getting their 215 cards and going to dispensaries and very fascinated with edibles and salves and they're now getting arthritis. And so they're actually looking at studies and seeing that we can help them. And even if they didn't agree with what we were doing 20 years ago, now they're finally you know, getting on board. So as long as we can establish ourselves as, I think, just Appalachians and what, again, sets, sets you apart as a different farm. And for us, I always hear it all the time and you get, a following and it's great to see the same customers come back again and again. Is that why you participate in this market? Because you can't be making a whole lot of money here, no. can you? Absolutely. No, it's not about making money, but it's a local market. So it's my grocery store, my health food store is right here behind us. So the checkers are here, you know, all the local business owners are here walking around. And so it's just, why not meet them? And, and they're, they're my most regular customers. You know, I see them once a month when I'm here, uh -huh. and it's great. 
And it, and do you sell your uh, craft cannabis any place besides at markets like this? I do from at some dispensaries. So there's some in you know the Bay Area, some around here too in Mendocino County. So just trying to do do the networking thing on my own. Uh, good for you. Well, so tell us what you've got going on here. What are you presenting to the uh, to the public today? All right. So today we have the Ringo's Gift, which is an amazing CBD strain, named after Ringo Lawrence, who passed away. His children are now taking on his seed company up in Southern Humboldt called So Hum Seeds. So this one tested at 0.8% THC and 12.3% CB, or I'm sorry, that was backwards. Point, yeah, 0.8% THC, 12.3 CBD. So it's a 15 to one. So this one is not psychoactive. It's something that, you know, you would want to take if your muscles hurt or if you're having anxiety, anything like that. But it's not going to put you out. You can still function for the rest of your day. So it's more relaxation or analgesic? Yes, absolutely. This one is just great for muscle relief, I feel. Um, and then the headband, this one is more of an evening uh, situation. So the Mitri Dutel are the names of Leo, uh, my former husband who's passed away, and then my middle names, both of our middle names. And so these were the seeds that we started out of an OG Kush and a Sour Diesel back in about 2008. So we just decided to name them after our grandparents' last names, which happen to be our middle names, and just kind of pay homage to our ancestors and why we're doing what we're doing. So so many people do not grow from seeds, so that's really remarkable that you do that. And yeah. what are the challenges of taking your uh, developing and, and uh, creating new strains from seed? It's fascinating. Well, when you start seeds, you gotta start about 500 at a time to even have males and females to kind of pick from. And then trying to figure out what works with what um, is something that, you know, I ask my other farmer friends, like, what do you think about this versus this? With the Michi Dutel headband, it just so happened that we had OG Kush and Sour Diesel seeds from our previous grows years and years ago. And so we just decided, well, we've got them both. Let's just start making our own and then we can have like a proprietary so the reason you decided to grow from seeds is what? Oh, just because I think that it's the most natural way to go. I mean, it came from a seed. Why would you want to just, I don't know. It seems a bit manipulative to just only grow from clones. So for me, I like it. I like the variety. And a lot of the land races that we do, like this next one, the Romulawi, is Romulan and Malawi. So it's two old African land races and... I don't think, like, people don't have clones of that, you know? It's easier if you can just start from where it came from. Well, this is my great fear, is that uh, we've got generations, whoa, bad, 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 bad. I'm so sorry. Let's cut all that. That's okay. They're in Sorry. So, um, I'll, st I'll take that from the top. So this is, my great fear is that if the, um, the large uh, investors and the large players who get involved in the cannabis market uh, for adult use in California really take over the marketplace that we will lose these strains. I is there any way that we can protect ourselves and keep these new strains that you've developed from seed? I mean, this is such a precious, the intellectual property alone over generations of what's been done here in the Emerald Triangle, we are at risk of losing that. What are your thoughts on that? I think that the more that we as farmers can keep our own seeds and acquire them from our friends and then trade them and educate people to grow from seed, you don't need to go buy clones, you know, just start earlier. Start thinking about this in January. But is that a trend that you see catching on? Because people need to rush into the, the marketplace is driving everything now. Right. I think, I think it's hard because maybe you can just have your mentality set on just working with the marketplace or actually cultivate what you love to do and how you love to do it. And maybe the marketplace will follow, but if not, you know what? There's always gonna be those high-end customers and clients. It's like the wine industry. It doesn't matter if you are don't have a tasting room and you're by appointment only and you only sell $150 bottles of cab, there's still gonna be customers out there that want that. Incredibly optimistic. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. Anything else you want to tell us today about what you're doing here? Um, what, what's this one? So this one is the Platinum Cherry Kush uh, that we got some seeds from from a friend of ours last year. So that one I we actually just got trimmed recently. We try to keep everything in bins and not trimmed until we actually need it. 
we feel like it preserves it a lot better than trimming all at once after harvest and then having things dry out, get moldy, whatever happens with it. We just kind of trim and process as we go and keep everything just in our cold warehouse and then it just goes into gallon sized jars. So yeah, the platinum cherry kush has been fun. It's like, it's new to me, so I'm just learning about it now. <laughs> um. I'd like to ask your opinion about we're at a very delicate place right now with county ordinance and they're going to be reviewing the ordinance next Tuesday and accepting uh, a lot of testimony from cultivators about how to change it and amend it. Um, are you optimistic or pessimistic and what do you think is going to happen next? What are your thoughts? I'm not sure. I'm hoping that the county is willing to just participate with us and just realize what's really happening here and that we can help out a lot and make some tax money for the county that they clearly want. Are there any aspects of the current cultivation ordinance in Mendocino County that you find particularly difficult or? Not yet. Um, I guess it's yet to be determined. Um, so far so good, you know, everybody's been really great. Yeah, oh yeah, and with the Ag Department and everything, and we did it last year with the Sheriff's Department, so it's not my first time having to fill out application stacks this big and you know do all that stuff so yeah we'll all get there you know it's a learning curve for sure i'd love to have your optimism well thank you so much yeah. janae for talking to us yeah, on cannabis exactly. news and views you bet yeah. I have a
And it's a full indica too, so it's body buzz, mellow. Oh, we have that in grams and eighty. Yeah, sure. I'm <laughs> 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 